Chapter 8 of The Life of Benjamin Franklin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lauren Cookma The Life of Benjamin Franklin by Samuel G. Goodrich Chapter Number 8 Management of his newspaper, study of the languages, chess playing, the preacher Hemphill, stealing sermons, visit to Boston, visits his brother James at Newport, usefulness of the junto, formation of new clubs, Franklin chosen clerk of the General Assembly, anecdote. Besides his almanac, Franklin considered his newspaper as a very valuable means of circulating instruction and good advice among the people. For this purpose, he frequently reprinted in it extracts from The Spectator, a work written a good many years ago by several distinguished English authors. It is a collection of pieces on moral and popular subjects in a very pleasant style, and the first published in single numbers of a few pages each. In conducting his paper, Franklin was very careful to avoid all abuse of particular persons. Whenever he was requested to publish anything of the kind, his answer was that he would print the piece by itself and give the author as many copies of his own use as he desired. He very wisely considered that his subscribers expected him to furnish them with the useful and entertaining pieces, and not with abuse and violent discussions about things with which they had nothing to do. In 1733, Franklin sent one of his apprentices to Charleston, South Carolina, where a printer was wanted. He furnished him with a press and types, and was to receive one-third of the profits of the business. After the death of this man, who was very irregular in settling his affairs with Franklin, the business was continued by his widow, this woman had been born and educated in Holland, where females were taught a knowledge of accounts. She managed the establishment with a great deal of prudence and success, and was in time able to purchase the printing office and establish her son in it. In 1733, Franklin began the study of foreign languages. He soon obtained such a knowledge of the French as to read books in that language with perfect ease. After this, he undertook the Italian. An acquaintance, who was also learning it, often tempted him to play chess. Finding this took up too much time, Franklin refused to play any more, except upon one condition. This was that whichever of them should be, should have the right to impose a task upon the other, either of part of the grammar to be got by heart or in translations. These tasks they were bound in honor to perform before the next meeting. The two friends played with about equal skill and success and in this way soon beat each other into a pretty good knowledge of the Italian. Franklin next undertook Spanish, and learned enough to read books in that language with considerable ease. About the year 1734, a young preacher arrived in Philadelphia by the name of Hemphill. He had a good voice and delivered very excellent sermons. Large numbers were attracted by his eloquence of different doctrines and belief. Among the rest, Franklin became a very constant hearer, he was pleased with the sermons, because they impressed the love and the practice of virtue and goodness, without quarreling about hard questions of doctrinal religion. Some of the congregation, however, disapproved of his preaching, and united with the old ministers to attempt to put him down. Franklin took sides with him very warmly, and did all he could to raise the party in his favor. He wrote two or three pamphlets in his defense. During this contest, the unlucky preacher heard his own cause, by a very unpardonable meanness. One of his enemies heard him preach a very eloquent sermon, and thought he had somewhere heard or read parts of it before. On looking into the matter, he found the preacher had stolen several passages from a discourse delivered by a celebrated English divine. His discovery induced many of his friends to desert him, and he was obliged to go in search of a congregation less inquisitive. After ten years' absence from Boston, Franklin determined to make a journey there to visit his rel relations. He was now doing a very good business, and was in quite easy circumstances. He had seen a good many changes in his fortunes since he first ran away from his native place, and his industry and good sense were to bring about still greater changes. In returning to Philadelphia, he stopped at Newport to see his brother James, who was, at that time, settled there with his printing office. Their former differences were at once forgotten, and the meeting was very cordial and affectionate. James was, at that time, in very ill health, 
and in expectation of a speedy death. He accordingly requested Benjamin, when that event should happen, to take home his son, then but ten years of age, and bring him up in the printing business. This he accordingly performed, sending him a few years to school before he took him into the office. When James died, his widow carried on the business till her son was grown up. At that time, Benjamin assisted them with an assortment of new types, and they were, in this manner, established to continue the establishment. The club in which Franklin had founded proved to be so useful and afforded so much satisfaction to the members that they proposed to introduce their friends and increase their number. They had from the beginning determined to keep the junto a secret, and the secret was kept better than such things usually are. Franklin was of the opinion that twelve members formed a, a club sufficiently, and that it would be inconvenient to increase it. Instead of adding to their numbers, he proposed that every member, separately, should endeavor to form another club, with the same rules and on the same plan, without informing them of the existence of the junto. The project was approved, and every member undertook to form his club, but they did not all succeed. Five or six only were completed, which were called by different names, as the Vine, the Union, the Band. These clubs were useful and afforded their members a good deal of amusement and information. In 1736, Franklin was chosen clerk of the General Assembly. The choice was made that year without any opposition, but on the next year a new member of that body made a long speech against him. This, however, did not prevent his second election. The place was one of some credit, and by giving Franklin an opportunity to make friends among the members, enabled him to secure the business of printing the public laws, votes, and paper money. The new member, who had opposed Franklin, was a man of education and talents, and it was desirable to gain his good opinion. Franklin was too proud to pay any servile respect to him, but was too prudent not to wish for his favor. After some time, with his usual shrewdness and knowledge of human nature, he hit upon the following expedient. Having heard that this gentleman had in his library a very scarce and curious book, he wrote a note requesting that he would do him the favor of lending it for a few days. The book was immediately sent, and in about a week was returned by the borrower, with a short note expressive of his sincere thanks for the favor. The next time they met in the house, the gentleman spoke to Franklin with a great deal of civility. He ever after manifested a readiness to serve him, and they became great friends. This is another instance, observes Franklin, of the truth of an old maxim I had learned, which says, He that has done you a kindness will be more ready to do you another than he whom you yourself have obliged, and it shows how much more profitable it is prudently to remove than to resent, return, and continue inimicable proceedings. In 1737, Colonel Spotswood, at that time Postmaster General, being dissatisfied with his deputy at Philadelphia, took away his commission and offered it to Franklin. He accepted it with readiness and found it great advantage. Though the salary was small, the office gave him the means of increasing the subscribers to his paper, and in this way increased his advertisements. His paper now began to afford him a very considerable income. End of chapter 8. Recording by Lauren Cookma.